Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Awesome. Good. 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 So, uh, at first, I'll introduce myself in Hawaiian uh, language. So, Buju, Jaya, Gingwa, Marcus Winchester, and Dijni Kass. Kabodai, Wadi, Mina, Odawa, and Dao, Jikwe, and Dodem. Kowater, Michigan, Dochpia, Mina, Bawa, Ti, Dada, Oroki. So I just said that my name is Marcus. Um, I come from the Potawatomi and Odawa nations or tribes. Um, I'm Thunder Clan. So the way that our uh, Potawatomi society um, is organized and governed and structured is through the clan system. Um, you heard Andrea and Major both um, announce their clans and um, everybody is born into a clan from their father and every clan has a duty and responsibility to the rest of the nation. Um, uh, political, military, spiritual, um, everything was taken care of through, through that clan system. So in theory, as long as everybody upheld the duties of their clans, um, the nation was healthy and vibrant and successful. So my duties to my people are that of the Thunder Clan. And I said I grew up in Coldwater, Michigan which is a little over an hour and a half east of here. Um, I did not grow up in this uh, community here, um, but I was always coming back with my mom and dad for one reason or another, um, all growing up. And um, uh, after I did the whole college thing and graduated, um, I came back to work for my people. And so the last part I said is I now live at the place of the rabbits. Um, Bawatik, and so that is actually Niles, Michigan. That's what our people used to call the Niles area. Um, and that refers to how rapidly the St. Joseph River used to be. Um, St. Joseph River used to be called Sinajwa Zibe. Uh, and that means a rough or difficult river. Um, a long time ago, before they dammed it and dredged it here and there, um, that river was really um, difficult, really rough and tough river. Um, but if you go over the St. Joe River now, it's a big, huge thing. Um, so I guess it was apparently really rapidly there in the Niles area. That's why we call it Pawatik. That's a quick explanation of who I am. Um, I work for the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians. I work in the language and culture department. And, um, I was honored to ask to be here and share a little bit about um, Potawatomi history and our connection to this, this place here, this um, institution, Notre Dame. So before I get talking, um, I wanted to share a quote that has always inspired me, and I think um, it resonates with a lot of what we do as contemporary Native Americans um, here today. Um, we have a difficult task set ahead of us. Uh, for those of us who wake up every single day and go to bed um, knowing and having that identity as a Native American person, they say that we have to walk in two different worlds um, and finding the balance between those two different worlds can be exhausting and stressful, but that's, that's the challenge that we have set forth for us. And this quote always kind of guided me ever since I was a teenager when I first heard it. Um, and so I'll share that real quick before I um, talk about um, our Pokegon Potawatomi history and legacy. So this quote is by um, a warrior, a leader from the Oglala people. His name was Many Horses. And he said that, I will follow the white man's trail. I will make him my friend, but I will not bend my back to his burdens. I will be cunning as a coyote. I will ask him to help me understand his ways, then I will prepare the way for my children and their grandchildren. The Great Spirit has shown me the day will come when they will outrun the white man in his own shoes. And so I'll let you guys think about that a little bit as I talk about the, the history of the Potawatomi people and how it relates to um, this area. So the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi people, the, the people that um, this flag, the seal right in front of us um, represents. Um, that, that title, Pokagon Potawatomi, is more recent within the last couple of decades. Um, if you were to read any historical work or work by anthropologists, they'll commonly refer to our group as the, either the St. Joseph 
um, Potawatomi or the Catholic Potawatomi. Um, and they obviously refer to us as the St. Joseph Potawatomi because we descend, okay, the band of Potawatomi Indians descend from the Potawatomi villages that surrounded and lived along the St. Joseph River. Um, we obviously incorporate a lot of other Potawatomi villages, but by and large, a lot of us descend from those villages that were along the St. Joseph River. Um, we were extremely active, our villages, our leaders, our warriors, um, our families were extremely active throughout all of um, early history here in what was once known as the Northwest Territory, um, this Great Lakes area. We were extremely active throughout that whole time period. Unfortunately, a lot of history portrays Native Americans as being idle throughout history, um, just kind of sitting around naked in the woods and letting things happen in their backyard and that is not the truth at all. Um, we were involved in every conflict, every major decision, everything that happened throughout history, we were there um, at the table helping make those decisions. Um, so we were involved in the, the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War. We were involved in the, um, the American Revolution. We were involved in all those different battles. And so by the time uh, the American Revolution had taken place and that was done and over with and the, the colonists had won and the United States of America was founded, um, obviously the United States wanted um, Anishinaabe land, they wanted um, Potawatomi land amongst other different nations um, throughout eastern United States. And so when they came to the Potawatomi people and started wanting to go in the treaty negotiations for lands, um, our Potawatomi leaders here in this area chose that rather than fight the Americans, they wanted to be proactive and have influence over the Americans. Because um, once again, we were extremely involved in all those previous battles, we were involved in all those previous events um, leading up to the American Revolution and the foundation of the United States. So our, our people saw what warfare did, they saw what all of those things did to communities, how they disrupted communities, how they tore apart families and um, uh, made things unfavorable um, living condition-wise. So our, our leaders had the mindset that they were, they were tired of that route and they wanted to have influence over the process rather than fight it. And so the tactic that um, our leaders took as early as the Treaty of Greenville in 1795 and that was the Treaty of Greenville in Ohio, which signed away um, much of Ohio and western sliver or eastern sliver of Indiana. Uh, what they requested was um, different aspects of European American culture. They requested blacksmiths, they requested European livestock, um, they requested schools, they requested um, for a mission to be established. They requested all these things into their community the idea was is they were going to pick and choose and incorporate different things into their livelihoods, into their village life that would hopefully in the long run give them advantage, give them the upper hand when it came time uh, when Americans would come in full force. And that's what they went about and that's what they requested. Unfortunately, a lot of those things that were promised to the Potawatomi people amongst other nations that signed that treaty, like the, the Odawa, the Shawnee, um, the Huron, the Miami, those other nations that signed that treaty. Um, we weren't delivered the things that were promised to us. A lot of the money that was promised to us was pocketed along the way. The livestock that was delivered um, either died along the way or they were malnourished by the time they got to our villages. And, and you can see the picture I'm painting there. Um, so um, what we expected ended up not being delivered. Um, this especially made um, made all the tribes very mad and very upset. Um, but the Shawnee people, um, raise your hand if you've ever heard of Tecumseh. How many of you guys heard of Tecumseh? A lot of you. So Tecumseh was a Shawnee leader. And like I said, the Shawnee people um, were part of the Greenville Treaty. And Tecumseh was a, a young, young warrior, a young leader at the time. And if you think about it, Tecumseh, or the Shawnee people were from Southern Ohio, Southern Indiana. They lived along the Ohio River there, Northern Kentucky. So they were right in the, the heat of um, all of the really negative interactions between Americans and Native American peoples. Um, the Shawnee were promised that they had this reservation land set aside and no Americans would come in there. Well, obviously American settlers were coming in and squatting on Shawnee land. 
On top of that, the things that were promised to them in the Treaty of Greenville were never delivered. So the Shawnee people were in a very vulnerable um, place and um, things weren't good for them down there. So guys like Sean, or Tecumseh decided that um, you know they were going to do something about it. So Tecumseh, um, along with his brother, they, they set out on a mission to try to round up as many Native Americans as they could um, on the eastern part of um, Turtle Island, or what we now call today North America, United States. And his whole mission was to get as many tribes together, banded together, to um, go to war with the United States, kick the United States out, and bring back the British. That was what Tecumseh wanted to do. Um, when Tecumseh came here to the Potawatomi and the St. Joseph River Valley, our leaders were um, standing firm to their original plan that they had set out in the late 1700s. They decided that they didn't want to go to war with um, America. By and large, many of our warriors and leaders decided that they didn't want to do that route and that they wanted to remain on course to try to have influence over the process rather than fight it. And so I'm not saying that there weren't any Potawatomi warriors or leaders from the St. Joseph um, River Valley that went and fought um, with the Kumsted. There most certainly were, but by and large, the majority stayed out. Um, and that's because they knew that Tecumseh would more than likely not be successful, uh, Tecumseh would more than likely fail, and when he did fail, everybody who supported Tecumseh was going to go home defeated, um, and the Americans would have the upper hand to get what they wanted out of those, those tribes that allied with Tecumseh. And obviously what they wanted was land. And the Potawatomi people here in the St. Joseph River Valley we wanted to stay home, we didn't want to go out west, and we um, stayed true to that we believe the best tactic to be able to stay here was to have influence over the process. So there were Potawatomi villages that did side with Tecumseh by and large. They were Potawatomi villages um, along the Wabash River, Potawatomi villages in northern Illinois, Potawatomi villages in southern Wisconsin. Those were the Potawatomi, um, a lot of them, a majority of them um, fought with Tecumseh. So Tecumseh ended up failing. Um, he was killed in battle at the Battle of Thames in 1813 in southern Ontario. And so just like what our leaders thought would happen is what happened. All of those Potawatomi that fought with Tecumseh went home defeated. Um, so those uh, Potawatomi had a decision to make. Some of them fled to Canada in order to remove, avoid removal. Some of those Potawatomi went into the woods of Wisconsin and hid out in the woods in order to avoid removal. Um, some of those Potawatomi willingly left out west because they didn't want to have anything to do with Americans. Um, a lot of them don't like to admit that, but there were certainly a number of villages that willingly left um, out west. And some of those Potawatomi said, I'm not going anywhere, I'm staying right here. So uh, those Potawatomi that said they weren't going anywhere, um, had to be forcibly removed by U.S. military, um, and they were um, escorted out at gunpoint at a lot of different villages. The, the most famous one that we hear about is the Potawatomi Trail of Death. Um, I think there's kind of a misconception that the Potawatomi Trail of Death was the removal of all Potawatomi. That's not the, the case. The United States military removed the Potawatomi very piecemeal. They went village to village to village to village. Um, the Potawatomi Trail of Death, in particular, was Chief Menominee's village um, in northern Indiana, and he had a large number of Potawatomi under his leadership. And so, while they were removed at gunpoint, um, approximately 60 people passed away along the way, mostly <coughs> young, um, young children. And so that's why that one gets the notoriety it does, but that wasn't the removal of all Potawatomi, um, like a lot of people think. So. That's the process that took place. Our Potawatomi here um, stayed here, um, and they decided that they were going to stay true to their tactic and um, what they wanted to do. So when the 1820s came around, the, our Potawatomi leaders here, there was obviously more treaties that took on here and there, but when they felt that the animosity had died down from Tecumseh's um, efforts that unfortunately weren't successful, um, that's when the Potawatomi leaders around here decided that they were going to once again uh, try to go forth with that technique, that tactic 
of requesting these different modes of European American culture. So that was requested at a treaty um, in the early 1820s, and finally some of those things started getting delivered. Um, a Baptist missionary um, was sent, or he was hired, I guess I could I should say, by the Potawatomi people, and he um, first tried to establish a mission amongst Chief Renominee, the one that I said was removed on the um, Potawatomi Trail of Death, but he um, decided not to stay with Chief Menominee, and he decided to move further north, try to find a better Potawatomi village that better suited his needs. So he eventually found himself um, near Topnabee's village, um, which is just right around what is now today Niles, Michigan, and he established um, what goes down in history as Cary Mission um, there. And the Cary Mission was meant to serve the Potawatomi people. Unfortunately, Cary Mission didn't go as planned. Um, Mr. Isaac McCoy, uh, he pocketed a lot of the money that was sent to service the Potawatomi people. Um, uh, the Potawatomi people requested cabins to be built to, uh, to reside in. Um, the, if you read old journals of settlers that passed through um, Cary Mission, they say that Isaac had the cabins contracted out and that they were so poorly built that there was extreme drafts through the cabins and if it rained or snowed, the fires inside the cabins would go out. Um, the fences that were built for the Potawatomi people, if the wind blew hard enough, the fences would fall over. Um, all the livestock malnourished. Nobody was attending services. The children weren't attending school um, because uh, Isaac wasn't meeting their needs. Isaac and his help weren't meeting the needs of the Potawatomi people. So eventually, the, our leaders um, in this region, they put their heads together and they decided, you know, we got to do something about this. And so they decided that, well, we got to fire Isaac, we got to get him out of here, and we got to bring somebody else in. And so that's when one of our leaders by the name of Leopold Polkagan, he, um, uh, old Indian guy, so think about this, he was in the 60s when this has taken place, he walked all the way from his village um, along the uh, Michigan-Indiana border. Um, so how many of you guys know where St. Pat's Park is? Here in northern Indiana, northwest South Bend. So his village was literally um, right by St. Pat's Park. If you were a really good golfer, you could hit a golf ball from uh, St. Pat's Park to um, Leopold's old village there. And so he um, traveled all the way from his village to um, the Detroit Catholic Diocese. And he got to Detroit and he went to Father Gabriel Richard. And he requested from Father Gabriel Richard um, to send a Catholic presence to take over a carry mission. Uh, Father Richard at first said, um, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with this. This sounds like your guys' beef. Um, leave me out of it. And the old story goes is that Leopold dropped to his knees and started reciting prayers. And so when the translator recited for um, Father Richard what Leopold was saying, it blew Father Richard away, it blew him out of the water because um, what was being translated were old Catholic prayers that the Potawatomi had learned from the French fur traders a hundred years prior. So after um, Father Richard had heard this, he said, all right, that's it, you got it, I'm gonna send you somebody. So he sent Leopold back home with a gentleman by the name of Father um, Baden. So Father Baden comes back with Leopold and um, Isaac gets wind of what's taking place. He gets wind that uh, Leopold is coming back with Father Baden and Isaac has the local militia stop them along the way and, and you know, there's uh, some words are exchanged, you know, what are you doing? And that's when the Potawatomi leaders tell him, you know, you're not meeting our needs. Um, carry mission isn't what we thought it would be, and so you're fired. And Isaac says, no, this is my mission. I'm not going anywhere. And Potawatomi say, no, you got to go. This is our mission. Isaac says, no, this is my mission. Finally, Leopold says, whatever, you can, um, Father Baden, come on down to my village. You can establish the the um, mission at my village. And so that's what takes place. Um, Father Baden um, goes down to Leopold's village and establishes a very, very successful mission. Um, a lot of children attended school. 
A lot of people were attending services, um, and everything that the Potawatomi had hoped for for those previous decades were finally coming to fruition. Um, in the meantime, uh, um, people like Isaac McCoy are writing letters back to our lawmakers in Washington, D.C. Um, Isaac even put out a book, it's, it was called The Indian Canon. And in these um, narratives that he produces, he is making the case that Indians are savages, they're incapable of learning how to read and write, um, they are incapable of living side by side with Europeans, um, they're basically just good for nothing, and if we, truly care, if we truly care about these savages, the best thing for them is to round them up, ship them west of the Mississippi, and let them live on their own. Um, in Indian Territory, or what would become Oklahoma. That was the best solution for these, these savages. And so it made its way through those suggestions, made its way through Congress, and that's how the Indian Removal Act um, was able to become federal law. Um, and that law dictated in 1830 that any Native American living east of the Mississippi had to be relocated west of the Mississippi. Um, and obviously we know that those things weren't true. Um, they really just wanted um, Native American land. Because if you look um, on the eastern part of the United States, there's still, there's still Cherokee in the Smoky Mountains. There's still tribes in the bayou. There's still Iroquois people living throughout New York um, uh, in areas around there. And so, um, so if you kind of think about that, the places where there are still plenty of Native Americans east of the Mississippi, they're in places where it wasn't readily um, able to um, start going into agriculture. Uh, Chief Menominee, the one that I told you about, the Trail of Death, he tried the exact same tactic, the exact same method that Leopold and the leaders around here did. He welcomed in um, schools, he welcomed in um, a church, he welcomed in and did all those exact same things. But if you've ever traveled out through certain parts of northern Indiana, there's prime farmland everywhere you go. There's natural prairies everywhere, and you can start farming almost immediately. Whereas where Leopold was at, there's trees everywhere, and there's going to be quite a bit of labor before you can start um, planting your crops. And so that's why Chief Menominee's tactic didn't work, and he was um, forcibly removed on the trail of death. So um, Indian removal was passed in 1830. Um, the United States wants to round up the last of the Potawatomi in the Southern Great Lakes. And so the Chicago Treaty of 1833 takes place and Leopold um, travels to that treaty negotiation. And at that treaty negotiation, Leopold stands up and says, all right guys, you want us to be removed because of A, B, C, D, and E. You said that all of these things um, uh, apply to us, but none of these things apply to us. Um, we're actually doing the exact opposite. Um, I have a very successful um, operation going on in my village. We're doing all these different things. And that's when the uh, United States representatives at that time said, you know what, you're right. And so um, within the Chicago Treaty of 1833, there was a provision made that Leopold Polkagan and his group of Potawatomi did not have to be removed um, from the uh, from Michigan based on their religious creed. And that's roughly what the language was in that treaty. So that's how Leopold and the people who sought refuge under his, his leadership were able to remain in this area. He actually um, wasn't allowed to stay here in Southwest Michigan, Northern Indiana. Um, he was supposed to move north and establish a village by the Arbor Croche, Michigan. Um, Harbor Springs, Petoskey area, if anybody's familiar with that. So Michigan looks like a hand up here in this area. That's Odawa territory. So when Leopold got up there, the Odawa people told him, you know, we just signed away the last of our land in the Treaty of 1836. So sorry, you know, there's nowhere for you up here. So what Leopold did is he came back down to southern Michigan. Um, he took all the money that had been accumulated from the different treaty negotiations and Leopold bought land from the state of Michigan and what is now today Silver Creek, Michigan, which is just northwest of Dowagiac, Michigan. So he moved his entire village from the Michigan-Indiana border that I previously mentioned and moved it up to Silver Creek, Michigan. Um, 
Father Baden ended up leaving. He went off to go establish uh, another mission amongst another group of um, Indians, Native Americans, and a replacement came in. Um, and Father Baden um, made uh, his replacement promise him that he would continue serving his Potawatomi children. And that replacement said, yes, I will continue serving the Potawatomi people. Um, on top of that, uh, the Catholic Church decided that they weren't going to move their headquarters along with Bokagan. They weren't going to move up into Michigan with Bokagan, but they decided rather that they would move further southeast into Indiana to establish their headquarters. Um, Leopold ends up passing away um, after they get established at Silver Creek. Before he passed away, he was getting ready to divvy up the land and assign a parcel of land to each and every individual family. Um, when Leopold passed away, uh, the Father Baden's replacement um, took it upon himself to tell the United States that um, their, their leader, their chief, he died, and so um, the new leader is um, Leopold's oldest son, Peter Bokagan. Um, but that's not how our leadership works. Um, we're obviously a democracy. We had somebody lined up that was going to take Leopold's place, and his name was Sinajwa. And um, so this made everybody in the village very upset. Then on top of that, Peter Bokagan decided that he wasn't going to follow through with Leopold's um, intentions of digging up the land and assigning um, all those different plots of land to the different families. Um, so this made everybody very upset. Then on top of that, we own land to the state of Michigan. So when you own land, what do you have to do every year? Yep, pay taxes. Um, as Indian people, we have an extremely different worldview and understanding of the universe. Um, and the understanding of, of why we're here as human beings. And one of those things that contributes to our worldview and how we're so different from a capitalistic European mindset is our, our how we look at wealth and how we look at um, things like that. So in the old school Indian way, you demonstrate your wealth not by how much you accumulate, but by how much you give back, how much you recirculate into the community. So yeah, we had treaty money coming in, but that money never stayed in our pockets. That money went immediately out to those who needed it. It went right back um, into the community. On top of that, um, local traders knew that we had a different perception of wealth and money. And so they would um, loan us things with a very high interest rate. So when uh, our treaty money did come in, they had their hands out waiting to be paid and so essentially we didn't have any money to pay these taxes to the state of Michigan. So there's a lot of different things going on here that's making the living environment very frustrating. And so Sanajwa uh, and Father Baru, they decide to take off and two thirds of um, the original village there breaks off and they um, move to uh, Rush Lake, which is near Hartford, Michigan today. And, and that's why today the Potawatomi people, the Pokagon Potawatomi people have three main communities. Those at Rush Lake, Hartford, Michigan. Um, those at Silver Creek, Gwajak, Michigan. And then um, Potawatomi families in South Bend, Indiana. And the reason why there are Potawatomi families in South Bend, Indiana is because of that relationship that we maintain with the Catholic Church. Um, so when I said that the Catholic presence, they didn't want to move their headquarters, um, up north in the Michigan with Leopold, that they decided to move their headquarters further southeast in Indiana. Um, and that was here in the South Bend area where they decided to um, relocate. Um, so Father Baden's replacement was Father Soren. So that name should make sense to a lot of you in here. For those who don't realize who Father Soren is, can somebody help me out with that? Spit it out. You guys know who Father Soren is. <laughs> University's founder. He goes down as the founder of the um, University of Notre Dame. So that is the connection that we have um, with this institution here. That's um, how the Catholic Church was invited to this area along the St. Joseph River. And, um, and that was the, the history behind the, the Pokagon Potawatomi people how we were able to maintain our presence here on this land 
and um, how this, this institution came to be. Um, very, very direct relationships. Um, so that's just a quick history of uh, how, how all that came about. And, and I guess the, the main point that I was trying to make there is that the legacy of the Pokagon Potawatomi people was our ability to, um, to, to, to blend two different cultures and use it in our advantage. Um, using the technology, using the different tools that were made available to us while remaining true to our identity and using it and capitalizing on that to get what we wanted. And so with that, I'll, I'll close it with a quote from Mr. Charles Darwin. Um, and a lot of people think of Darwin as um, the guy who says that um, survival of the fittest, but that's um, very misconstrued and that wasn't what the point he was trying to make it off with his theory. And so he had to clear the air and he said this quote, and I think it fits very well and helps establish our legacy as the Pokagon Potawatomi people, and it helps us with our mindset as we try to move forward with um, maintaining our indigenous languages and the different techniques that we should seek while maintaining our indigenous languages. So Mr. Darwin said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. Miigwech.